Welcome everybody uh, to Designing Group Mentoring Curriculum. Uh, my name is Jerry Shirk. I'm one of your presenters today. The other presenter is William Figueroa of Los Angeles Team Mentoring. We'll introduce ourselves um, a little bit later, but uh, just want to uh, talk about the today's training. And next slide, please. So before we get started, uh, we need to do some attributions. Of course, this training is a, a project of OJJDP. Um, and the disclaimer is, uh, you can read it below, the opinions, findings and conclusions, recommendations expressed uh, are those of the presenters and do, do not necessarily reflect those of uh, Department of Justice. And we want to acknowledge the affiliates who uh, are on the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series team. And you can see them there. Um, and as it says, this webinar is funded by OJJDP uh, through the National Mentoring Resource Center. And of course, uh, Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, is the managing partner of, of uh, NMRC right now. Um, just a few things for housekeeping before we get started i want to share some information in one week you'll receive an email with with info about how to download a copy of these slides along with um, all the handouts and you can also uh, view the webinar recording at that time or you can also access this information directly by going to mentors website in the next week uh, we're continually looking to improve this series, so we're looking for your input. A short survey will pop up as you exit the webinar, so please take three minutes uh, directly after the webinar is finished to give us your feedback. And um, how to participate in today's webinar. As you can see, all attendees are muted. For the best sound, if you have questions, please type them in the box. Mini Chen of uh, Mentor will be queuing up the questions. And I want to thank Mini for uh, helping to put this webinar and all the other webinars together. But anyway, she was she will share um, with uh, William, William and myself questions um, uh, that you put into the box. We may not get in, get to all the questions because they're will be several hundred of you on the webinar, but we will do our best. Uh, so the questions that many will share with us are generally the ones that broaden or deepen the conversation. And to get started, we're gonna take a poll. First, to get a sense of who is with us today, we have two short polls. Uh, so what is your experience level in the mentoring field? Please select one of the following. Beginner, experience, expert. And we'll give you a few seconds. So about a third are beginners, uh, two thirds are ex uh, experienced, and a small percentage are experts. Well, that's great, that, that gives us an idea of who's there. The second poll is, what is your role in the mentoring field? Please select one of the following, practitioner, researcher, TA provider, funder, or other. Give you a couple seconds. We'll take a look at the results. Practitioners, almost two thirds. Uh, researchers, TA providers, a small percentage, no funders, and others about a third. Well, that's great. That gives us an idea of who's in the webinar today. So we'll get started. I, I will start by introducing myself. Um, if I find the webcam, I'm just going to share my webcam during the introductions and the questions. So um, my name is Jerry Shirk. I worked in the field of mentoring for about 20 years. I'm a former school counselor and in the school system. I did a lot of uh, group counseling and, and also in private practice. But my most intense learning period for group mentoring was when I developed and ran group mentoring programs in San Diego City Schools and the Brona Indian Reservation for about six years. 
So I, I continue to be a full-time consultant and trainer. Much of the time I work um, as a consultant for the National Mentoring Resource Center through the very good people at Mentor Colorado. In a former career, more than a lifetime ago, I, was, uh, I played 12 years as a defensive tackle for the Cleveland Browns. And I credit that experience for learning much about leadership and mentoring. So I want you all to know that I am really sold on group mentoring. I, I love group mentoring. I think it's a great model. And I've developed some tools and strategies for designing uh, group mentoring programs. And I want to share those with you today, along with William. And so I'm going to introduce William. Then I want him to say a few words. Uh, but I'm very excited to introduce my co-presenter today, William Figueroa. Uh, William is the director of Los Angeles Team Mentoring, a program that has been around for about a quarter of a century. So when a program stays around for that long, you know that they're doing something right. And I know that one thing that they did right was hire William about 13 years ago. And I know that he'll want to share the credit with his team. And he does have a great uh, staff there at Los Angeles Team Mentoring. But I believe that that William is the heart and, heart and soul of Los Angeles Team Mentoring, and it's a program that mentors around 1,200 uh, youth each year in the Los Angeles Unified uh, School District. I want to, uh, to uh, let you know that when I reached out to William about five or six months ago to help out on this webinar, he regretfully declined because he said he was probably going to be too busy. When, when you've got a program with 1,200 young people, you are pretty darn busy. Uh, but I kept bugging him, and uh, it's uh, my honor to uh, to have him as a co-presenter today. And I really wanted him to present because I know he knows so darn much about group mentoring. So, William, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. And you may be on mute. Sorry about that. You know, we got to get used to that mute button. Uh, thank you, Jerry. So just wanted to give you guys a quick uh, opportunity to match the face and the voice. So I turned on my camera briefly so you guys could uh, to, to take a gander, if I may. <laughs> and then I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off and we'll start today's presentation. So welcome, everyone. It's good to see everyone on the call today. Thank you again, Jerry. As I said, I've known Jerry for, for numerous years. Um, so without further ado, do, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. So I'll see you guys on the back end when we have our Q&A. Thank you, William. And just a little bit about what we're going to cover today, of course, uh, processes for developing uh, group mentoring programs and mentoring curriculum, group mentoring curriculum. Can't really talk about mentoring curriculum without talking about your program model and and that's the delivery method. We're also going to cover the flow of activities. We have lots of handouts, so the flow of activities matrix is in the handouts. Facilitation strategies for, for group mentoring, and then LA team mentoring's process for curriculum development. And uh, very exciting to me, their move to virtual mentoring. They just uh, finished a pilot program for virtual mentoring, and when I talked to William, as we set up this presentation, he's very, very excited about uh, delivering group mentoring virtually. And then we have about seven or eight slides on no cost resources for group mentoring curriculum. So next slide, please. Um, group mentoring is really coming on strong. Um, as a consultant for mentoring programs, I've noticed in the past few years, in any given year, uh, 40 to 60 percent, of course, with that averages to 50 percent of the programs that I've served are at least have some combination of group mentoring. I recently talked to uh, Mike Geringer, the Director of Research and Evaluation at Mentor, and he said that he is seeing similar numbers. Um, so it makes sense that the group model is growing as it can be. Uh, less time intensive for staff. It can be less costly. It has tons of other benefits, including uh, a big one, which is using peer-to-peer -peer relationships, as they say, the power of the milieu. And of course, it can be used to deliver curriculum. So for skill building and uh, building folks or young people's confidence. 
the effective practices, um, it's become so prominent that Mike Geringer and the team of mentors just recently put together a new supplement, the elements of effective practice for group mentoring. Uh, William and I were honored to be on the work group that reviewed it, and it looks really good. I believe it came out in early September, so we've provided a link uh, on one of the uh, end slides for, for those practices. Uh, next, please. So the types of group mentoring programs utilizing curriculum, uh, as it says here, we're just beginning to develop the language to categorize various models of group mentoring. And, you know, we just came up with the supplements after all these years to, to really look at the best practices for group mentoring. So right now we're looking at uh, what we might call conventional groups, and this language may change, but conventional groups are, it could be a one to three or four model. So one being the mentor, three and four being the mentees, or a two to eight model or three to 10. I believe William at Los Angeles Team Mentoring in person uh, typically uses the three, three mentors to 10 or 12 mentees. And then there are hybrid group models, which are uh, combinations of one-to-one -one matches and group mentoring. And then there are many models that, you know, they're all over the board, really. You know, one-to-one -one is really self-descriptive, one mentor and one mentee. But when you come to group mentoring, it can be any number of mentors with any number of mentees and including spontaneous or loosely uh, structured, structured groups. Uh, so uh, the types of mentoring that um, we're going to talk about today, we're, we're, we're going to talk about the use of curriculum. So basically it'll be conventional or hybrid groups, the type of groups where uh, people are either sitting around a circle or you have a group of mentees in a classroom and one or two or three mentors are helping to deliver curriculum. And if... Um, just want to say too, if if you if you don't have that model, we just hope that some of these strategies will be pertinent and helpful to to your programs. Next slide, please. So as I've been helping mentoring programs, one of the questions is how to put the mentoring, actual mentoring, into group mentoring. And so one thing that we've done is to can, you know, kind of scratch your heads and think back, well, what is what is one-to-one -one mentoring? Well, it's about relationship building. So you might say that to have a true group mentoring program or a mentoring program that, that, that puts mentoring into their group mentoring activities, there has to be relationship building. And of course, that can be uh, mentor to mentee and then mentee to mentee, the milieu or the, the power of peers, and then mentors to mentor. Uh, mentors need to have good relationships with each other. So number one is relationship building. Number two is a safe place for mentees to share. And when I think about that, I think about giving young people the ability to express themselves, to tell them, to tell you who they are, you know, verbally to, to uh, share how their week was. Uh, if, if you don't do that, you're, you could be you know, skill building, you could be doing enrichment activities, but you, if you're not finding about finding out about the mentees and their hopes and their dreams and their fears, um, then you're probably not doing what's called mentoring. And then the third sort of the big key is curriculum to, pr to promote both of the above, both the relationship building and then a safe place for mentees to share. Now, the curriculum is... Uh, I think it was Mike Geringer, I was reading a white paper that he helped write, and he said, curriculum is the something to do for group mentoring. So if you don't have the something to do, you're just kind of gathered around staring at each other. So next slide, please. So uh, a good way to go about this is to develop a, a curriculum design team. It could also, if you're brand new, it could be a program design team. So it's my philosophy that uh, programs and curriculum are better designed by multiple people than just one person's vision. If you have one person's vision, you know, you don't want to have the Jerry mentoring program with the Jerry curriculum. You want to have input from people that are vested in, in the young people. So that could be staff, your staff, it could be teachers if you're working in a school, counselors. 
uh, it's great to have Minty input and, and if, if you can, and you can reach out through the National Mentoring Resource Center and get this no cost, possibly a mentoring consultant. So the tasks for the design team are listed there. Uh, of course, determining the program structure, which include the intended Minty outcomes. That's, that's kind of like, why are they referred? Why are they there? What are you trying to uh, help change? the mentor to mentee ratio and group sizes, which we'll talk about in a moment, the length of the program, the, the frequency and duration of the meetings, and then of course, what we're talking about today a lot is uh, creating a curriculum. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Over the years, I've, I've tried to, to um, consolidate some of the points that really help put the mentoring into to group mentoring. And so these are what I came up with. It's not the final product and it's not the be all end all, but it's just kind of a current version. I, I do have uh, these um, eight points in the handouts and I, I discussed them at link or you know wrote about them at link. So there's about 12 pages. And because there's 12 pages, I'm gonna go over them really quickly today. So the first is be intentional by actually making it a mentoring program, by integrating mentoring into the program design. And that means a focus on relationships, a focus on understanding who these young people are, uh, of, of finding out their hopes and their dreams and their fears and their strengths and their obstacles. Um, and that is through uh, relationships and, and of course, the curriculum can, facil can facilitate that. Next is designate an optimum number of mentees and mentors and mentees for each group. Optimum means workable. And so if you're gonna have discussion groups, I like uh, the two to, two to eight model or the three to 10 to 12. You wanna have uh, the number small enough in a group if you're going to ask them how their week was that uh, everybody has a chance to talk. If you have 20 people and ask them how their week was, you know, it's like, okay, the session's over after they, after they tell you how their week was. And again, each of these are, are really delineated in the handout. So determine a consistent fun functional meeting schedule. So, you know, group mentoring isn't meeting twice a year or, or once every two months, just like relationship development in a one-to-one -one program needs consistency so does a group mentoring program, both to develop relationships and to deliver curriculum. So if you do deliver curriculum every six weeks, they're not gonna remember what happened six weeks ago. Then match mentors and mentees based on their strengths and needs. Um, so um, just a couple points here, you wanna match, if, if you have two or more mentors per group, you wanna match them on, their strengths and uh, well you want at least one experienced mentor in a group and then as far as the mentees in the group you want a good mix you don't want all the discipline problems in in one group and all the the kids that are leaders in in the other group uh, next slide please uh, so create a safe place for mentees to share so teach train mentors on how to facilitate uh, small groups uh, never force shy mentees to share, train mentors on problem solving. Mentors need to uh, not tell mentees what to do, just like in one-to-one, -one, but to ask them, what do you think they should do? And to affirm when they come up with something good and to redirect when they come up with an unhealthy behavior. So, um, um, you know, the, the phrase is, well, you could do that, but what might happen? And then so you training mentors on group facilitation and then standardize the flow of activities. And we've, we've got some diagrams later, but um, it's just a way to structure your activities, kind of like a teacher's lesson plan. And it helps mentors to work together to see who is gonna do what, when. And it, it erases that walking into a room with a group of mentees and you know, everybody's looking at everybody going, okay, what now? And then use uh, fun and inspiring a curriculum. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about. And William really has a line on the using the inspiring and educational curriculum. Okay, next please. And I'm gonna turn it over to William for his block of slides. 
All right. Thank you, Jerry. So again, just really quickly, just wanted to thank everyone on the call today for all that you do to promote, protect, and support youth. Um, it's truly a beautiful thing and humbling to see everybody. All right. So switching gears. So again, my name is William Figueroa. I'm the Director of Programs for Los Angeles Team Mentoring for over 13 years now. Our organization was born out of the LA riots in 1992. I don't know if we have any Angelinos on the call today. Um, but, you know, here we are, unfortunately, 28 years later, and we're still dealing with the same injustices that plague our inner city communities. However, you know, I'm really proud of this, that, you know, even though we still have these injustices going on in our inner city communities, you know, we're still there. Our program is still there. We're there helping students who need us the most with the goal of getting our kids to dream big and believe in themselves. And over the course of 28 years, we have served 28,000 kids. Yes, that's a lot of kids. Um, our program also serves anywhere between 1,300 and 1,200 kids a year with the support of over 300 committed and caring mentors. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are certainly busy. Additionally, we provide our program in 11 Title I funded schools throughout Los Angeles County during the after school hours. And as many of you uh, may know, these are the, the hours when kids typically engage in risky behavior. Um, but let me back up for a moment and let's talk about our model. So our model is unique in that we use a team approach to mentoring, which essentially mirrors a group model. In our program, uh, our team approach involves a teacher, a college mentor and community mentor working with 10 to 12 youth while leveraging a social emotional learning curriculum specifically designed to really meet the unique developmental needs of at-risk middle school youth. And it's just something for you guys to keep in mind as Jerry was talking about the importance of really developing your curriculum. Really think about, you know, what, what are your goals? And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And overall, our mission is to guide middle school youth living in challenging urban environments to recognize and reach their full potential as members of our community. Through our school-based team approach to mentoring, our young adolescents are provided the tools and support necessary to make positive choices during a critical period of their lives. Next slide, please. So to get things started, I'd like to share about the importance of structure, Jerry touched on this, and having a set of organized activities and curriculum for the youth in your programs. So again, you'll probably hear me saying this repeatedly, structure, structure, structure. Now, did I say it enough structure? Things can truly go awry when there isn't any structure. So when developing your group mentoring model, start to think about the mentor to mentee ratio in the activities or curriculum you will offer. How many mentors and how many mentees will you serve in your groups? And what will be the objectives or goals you would like to achieve with the kids in your program? At, at LATM, our initial model and curriculum, um, we were fortunate, was designed by the Princeton Learning Center. And then, you know, from there, we settled on a model and a curriculum. Um, so our, our model is the three mentors to 10 to 12 youth, which allows for a one to four ratio. So as you can see in this slide, we have a very specific, we have very specific mentor types that we recruit. In our program, as I mentioned earlier, we recruit a teacher mentor to really help with school engagement, right? They become that constant for the kids. Um, and then a college student to promote higher learning. Many of the college students who join our program have really have similar backgrounds to our kids. And then a community mentor to really offer that big picture, offer life skills. So as you're thinking about the configuration of your mentor teams, I also recommend you consider the diversity of your mentors, if possible. Um, specifically, spe specifically, though, in regards to the personality types, a good balance of personalities will set you up for success. So you're probably thinking about that. What does he mean, personalities? Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So in our program, we've seen tremendous success in having a carefully structured matched mentor team. And again, that is in our program, having three distinctly different mentor types and personalities. Um, so the personalities, you don't want too many shy or reserved mentors on a team. You don't want too many you know, overly dynamic folks. You wanna have a good healthy balance of those personality types. A good blend of really dynamic folks and maybe folks that you know, maybe a little bit more reserved. However, we're gonna talk about, even though you have those reserved folks on your team, you still want them to be engaging. 
Um, so in our program, as we're creating our mentor teams, we want to make sure we have that diversity, as I mentioned earlier. And we've also found that when you have that great diversity and you set them up with a great curriculum um, and you have them you know, working with that curriculum, that you really can challenge your kids critical thinking skills and allow them to see the world from many different perspectives and viewpoints. Next slide, please. So at LATM, we have a strong focus on developing, of course, trusting relationships with our students. We know that when the trust is built, then our students feel safe and as a result, start to open up and share who they really are, what their challenges are and what their hopes and dreams are. And when this happens, I like to say the magic, our mentors are able to truly guide and inspire them because now they have greater insight and in how the, you know, the kids are thinking. Um, so again, really think carefully about the development of your curriculum and activities. I like to start with, you know, when we're thinking about curriculum development, what sort of skills, competencies, or knowledge we would like our kids to learn or develop. For example, just going to give you an example. So maybe in your program, you know, you'll decide what is it exactly you want to tackle, but is it something like body image? Is it how to resolve conflict more positively? Is it to adapt or adopt a growth mindset, et cetera? And what's really interesting is that in our program, um, that we don't focus on tutoring or academics. However, we've made an incredible impact on our students' learning and connection to school. Again, just utilizing a social emotional learning curriculum. Two years ago, we had an independent study conducted on our program to learn that our mentees have higher grades, better school attendance, and go on to graduate at a 22% higher rate. So again, we're not a tutoring program. We're all based on social emotional learning. So you might be asking, how, how is this possible? So at LHM, we strongly believe that if, if our kids can't focus or unpack what's going on with them emotionally and mentally, then they can't focus on school. But here's where the beauty of mentoring comes in. And that is having one or more trusted adults in a young person's life can make a world of difference. Adults who care and listen. And what's more, if you have the right curriculum in place, your curriculum can serve as a springboard for incredible conversation and self-discovery. Again, that curriculum can really serve as a springboard for incredible uh, conversation and self-discovery. Again, think about the composition of your mentor-mentee teams, as well as pay close attention to the design and goals of your curriculum and activities. And I have just one more major suggestion I'd like to make, and that is allow for breath. Again, allow for breath in your curriculum, which means leverage your curriculum in a manner that allows for a healthy dialogue and communication. I know sometimes when we jump into curriculum, we get ambitious and we get excited and we throw in all these elements that, of course, are very valuable, but you sometimes got to step back and just really look at your curriculum again and say, am I allowing breath in this curriculum? Is there opportunity for the kids to talk and share and open up and foster discovery? So that's one of you know, my major recommendations as you're thinking about your curriculum, the development of your curriculum. Next slide. Now, daring, now, bearing in mind that today's webinar is really about curriculum de development, it's important to understand that you can't de deliver your curriculum or meet your goals without your mentors being properly trained. They must know how to facilitate your curriculum, understand group dynamics, and most importantly, know the goals of your program and curriculum. At LHM, we know that mentor training is so very important because of all these variables. However, in a group model, there's some additional constructs that should be considered. So when training, train your mentors as you would in a one-on-one -on -one model, focusing on relationship building. Except in a group model, you emphasize the importance of trying to bond with multiple kids. For example, you know, try to learn something about each mentee. Um, and so on. In our model, we've also seen an organic one to four bond between our mentors and mentees. So if anyone is questioning, is it possible to bond? It is possible to bond. Um, and we've been doing it for 28 years and we've seen a tremendous, um, you know, a, we've seen tremendous bonding between mentors and mentees in a group model. And also, as I mentioned, you know, train your mentors on the goals and intended outcomes of your program, activities, and curriculum. 
This will help guide your mentors as they work with your kids. Again, the concept of structure gives them the plan of action and purpose. Again, so having that structure, that structured curriculum in place really helps your mentors have a plan of action and purpose. You know, we all like having goals and, and the mentors aren't are any different. Um, and in our program, our mentors have told us that they find it really helpful knowing the goals and objectives of our program. And most definitely train your mentors on group facilitation. Make sure they understand that they're responsible so hear me out here. They are responsible for the flow of information, stimulating the, the, the learning and managing the dynamics of their team, including behavior management. So I'm going to repeat that again. Make sure they understand they are responsible for the flow of information, stimulating the learning and managing the dynamics of their team. And on the front end, I suggest taking advantage of Zoom, this new tool that we all now have and conduct phone screening with your mentors. I like to call it, I was sharing this with Jerry not too long ago. I, I make a little fun. I said, I call it the screen test. Uh, this way you can truly observe the personalities and fitness of the volunteers signing up for your programs. I would also like to recommend while you're doing your phone screening to make sure your mentors are comfortable working in a group setting because group mentoring is not for everyone. All right, next slide. Uh, so this slide is an example of our session outline. Allow me to give you a quick overview of, our, of the segments of our outline. Each week, mentors and mentees follow this exact outline as they spend time together. The purpose, for example, of what's good with you is for everyone to kind of check in and over time to get, become better acquainted and strengthen the bonds between members of the team. Question of the day is there to help to keep the conversation going. And as our mentors are trained, we encourage everyone to keep the dialogue going as much as possible which helps with engagement and keeps kids interested. We then move into our main activity or core objective, and then we move into a reflection exercise followed by the one big thing I learned today that was offered to us by Jerry. If I didn't mention this, Jerry really helped us a couple years ago revamp our entire curriculum. Uh, so the one big thing I learned today is really aimed at capturing both individual and collective learning. Again, individual and collective learning as we sit in a circle and we ask um, each mentee, you know, what did they learn about the session that day? In our program, we also have six cycles or six phases um, made up of six sessions per cycle. So for you mathematicians out there, six times six is 36 group meetings. Each session is at one hour long. Um, and this is important, it's one hour long, and we find that this time frame is optimal, not too short, not too long, but just enough to keep the kids uh, engaged and focused. And I'm gonna talk about this, but it, this, this time frame is really important in our new virtual world. And as I mentioned before, structure is tremendously important. So that said, each week we review the session outline and explain in great detail the overall goals and objectives for that particular session. We provide our mentors with a copy of the curriculum and a two to three minute instructional video in advance of their session. This way, they're all well prepared and can decide as a mentor team how to divide the different aspects of the curriculum outline. Once again, we have a curriculum that's designed to meet the unique developmental needs of middle school youth. And at this age, our youth are trying to belong. You know, they want to feel like they're good at something or many things. They're starting to assert their independence, want to be more in control of their lives. They want to feel like contributors or like they have something to offer. And with all that in mind, we cover topics such as team building and cooperation, respect and communication, self-esteem, anger management, conflict resolution. Ooh, this one's important. Digital citizenship. And recently added with everything that's going on, um, in our society, social justice. All right, next slide. So as this slide describes, as a program team, we sit down at the end of each program year to discuss the results of our pre and post survey. So we include pre and post surveys. It's really important to really have that temperature check with your surveys. Um, and then really, you know, work with a consultant if you can, if you don't have the expertise and background in developing surveys, because depending on the population you serve, um, you want to make sure that the questions are really tailored um, for, for whatever that age range is. Ours is middle school, so it's really uh, been a little difficult for us to really um, have the right tool in place, but we finally have gotten there. Um, so we look at our pre and post surveys, we carefully look at the results and decide whether we can improve or tweak our social emotional learning curriculum. We also consider current events 
and decide what's relevant to the population we serve. And when it makes sense, add those uh, relevant topics to our curriculum. For example, you know, not too long ago, you, we, we had the gun violence that was going on in our school. So we integrated in our curriculum uh, preventing gun violence. And with what's going on now, we've now, as, as, as I mentioned, we've um, integrated social justice. We further examine the unique culture of each school of, and community to ascertain if there's an additional need to tailor our curriculum for a particular school or community. And much of this information is gathered from serving our teachers, counselors, and principals and what is needed for their school. For example, we had a school that was struggling with boys disrespecting girls. So that year, we integrated three activities centered on teaching boys how to be more respectful to girls. So as you can see, each construct of our curriculum is specifically intended to build our students' social and emotional learning skills. We hope at the end of the day, with carefully vetted mentors and having clear and measurable objectives, including well thought out and matched teams and a tailor-made curriculum, we're offering our program clients the inspiration and structure that leads to developmental success. And that is that our kids have a connection to one or more trusted adults, are associating with a positive group of peers, are optimistic and future oriented, and most importantly, one of my favorite words, resilient, able to bounce back from adversity. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry now while I catch a breath and get a sip of water, um, but I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about something that I am truly excited about, and that is our pivot from in-person mentoring to virtual group mentoring. All right, Jerry. Thank you so much, uh, William, for describing your program and how you develop your curriculum. And I'm going to try to, to make my uh, block of, uh, what, about five or six slides pretty short so you'll have more time to talk about your pivot, because I think that's exciting, too. Uh, just want to show you a, a group mentoring program session development matrix. And it's just kind of like a teacher's lesson plan. and. Uh, William has mentioned it about five times, structure, structure, structure. Uh, and, and that is really the key, especially with new mentors. Uh, you you want to have uh, all the structure in place. And th this is a way to des design what's going to happen in a session. You can move things around. It doesn't always have to be in the session. You're going to want to have to figure out where you know the kids, if uh, there are a lot of schools are not going face to face now, but if somebody was sitting in a classroom, you might want to have a, um, a physical warmer to, to start out. Uh, but this, this is just uh, a way to do it. It's basically who does what, when, and for how long. Next slide, please. I also believe in standardizing the curriculum. So uh, we have a lot of resources at the end of these slides, like seven or eight slides on different resources. So you can go through and pick and choose different pieces of curriculum, but in in my view, you want to standardize things for your mentors. You don't want to hand them stuff that looks completely different. You don't want to hand them something that's two sentences of description of how to do an exercise for one exercise and 10 pages for another. So if you put them kind of in a template form, and this is the one that I use, name of exercise, objectives, materials needed, estimated time instructions, and uh, deb debrief points. It just gives the mentors a sense of, of what they're looking at, that that everything they they need to know is going to be in in these instructions. And of course, in, in a program like Williams, they actually go over the the next piece of curriculum um, be, you know, before the session. Actually, I, I believe they meet when they're meeting in person, they met after the session and talk about the next week's session. So next, please. Next slide. So sharing really puts the mentoring into group mentoring. It's really one way, you know, William talked about, you know, understanding the hopes and dreams and the personalities of the young people. Um, when I was facilitating my groups, I always did something called good news and bad news. Tell us something good that happened since the last time we saw you and something not so good. William, uh, uh, talking with him, changed it a little bit because uh, he didn't necessarily uh, want his mentees to go that that deeply into their bad news um and uh, he but he allows it he definitely allows you know time for discussion about that so he he calls it what's good going on uh i've, I've worked with programs that just have a gratitude sharing so that kind of puts a positive positive spin on 
the discussion. And usually if a young person has something on their mind, even if it's gratitude sharing or what's good going on, they're going to tell the other side too. And so that's that's good because it gives them a, a chance to get support from the group. And never force shy mentees to share. You know, mentees are volunteers too. And if, if they feel uncomfortable coming to your program, they're not going to show up. And along with that, you, it's good to train mentors or tell mentors to, you know, if they're working with a shy mentee, not to say, oh, you're you're shy, you don't have to share, because then that puts a label on them and makes them even more shy. Mentors should also share in their lives, like good news, bad news, what's going on, but not too deeply. So, you know, a mentor would not come in, you know, at least a, a somebody that's acting appropriately and talk about some argument that they had with their significant other. So you, you could talk about a flat tire, that's your bad news, and maybe how you cooked spaghetti and it was edible, and that's your that's your good news. But really, sharing is a real key. Um, I wanted to uh, go on to the next slide, and I'm just going to go over these really quickly because there we do have links. Uh, not only this link, but in the I think this is the last slide for resources. We have links to Project Arrive. We just wanted to talk real quickly about <clears throat> a really good program with a really good comprehensive curriculum. So, uh, and they've actually uh, presented on these webinars. I believe they they presented last year. So um, there's there's the link. They're in uh, San Francisco Unified School District. They developed in 2010 to help ninth graders transition. They have a two to eight to ten model. They meet one time a week. Uh, for a period of a school year, uh, and they use Tuckman's stages of development. So that's the, the uh, I believe, the storming, forming, norming, and performing. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> William talked about <clears throat> using the, the 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 topics that are appropriate for your mentees. What are you trying to get done with your mentees? Well, Project Arrive wants to help ninth graders transition into high school so that you can see that these particular curriculum topics uh, when covered will help them move on to the next level and i know we're going through quickly but i, I do want to give william time to talk about his pivot to group mentoring so next slide please uh, a really interesting thing to me for Project Arrive, when I researched it, uh, they give mentors and sometimes mentees the flexibility regarding the use of the curriculum. So if you go to their website, a lot of their curriculum topics are posted there. And again, the, the, the mentors will gauge where the mentees are and it allows them in real time to, to change. So William talked about things happening in, you know, current events and, and how that's changed his curriculum. Well, with Project Arrive, they can do that from week to week. This program was studied extensively by uh, Dr. Gabe Cooperman, who's on the research board for Mentor. Uh, and um, we really owe him a debt of gratitude that, that he and other researchers are really beginning to study for best practices on mentoring. So these are their findings, a lot of positive findings. And next slide, please. And so I went through those really quickly because I wanted to give William time to talk about uh, the, the pivot, his exciting pivot to virtual group mentoring. Take it away. All right, Jerry, thank you. And I'll try to be brief as I know we're running out of time as well. So, all right, so as you all know, we're living through a horrible pandemic. And due to the COVID uh, crisis, we had to pivot and really reimagine our core in-person mentoring program. So it really wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy feat and required a great deal of research, support from our schools and teachers, and the assistance of consultants to really help us redesign everything we knew to be successful in in-person mentoring and switch it over. Really think about this: switch it over to a one and a half by one and a half inch virtual box. Yeah, so just imagine everything that we did in person and that, that the three to four dimensional world that we live in in person and switching it to a two dimensional world and trying to have an engaging, exciting mentoring program in a one and a half by one and a half inch box. So our main concern as we started and embarked on this new journey was to find a workable solution 
right? Well, a, a platform that would really help us facilitate our virtual sessions. So in our organization, we came up with a number of criteria as, as you're looking at this slide uh, to really find the vendor that was the right fit for our program and our group model, of course. Our staff put their heads together and this is what we came up with as far as a wish list. We interviewed, and, and when I say we interviewed, we interviewed and, and, and we uh, test drove, we got a lot of demos on numerous companies until we found the right platform that met most of our needs. Now, we didn't get everything on our wish list, but we, we, we really were quite pleased with the vendor we chose. And when we initially embarked on this journey to find this new platform, we had three though, this was important, three major priorities. And that was it had to be safe. And I'm sure we can all agree we wanted to be safe. Um, it had to be easy, so very user friendly, not just for the mentors, but for the mentees. And then, you know, we wanted to make sure that it supported a group mentoring model. All right, next slide, please. So, you know, we tested out the fitness of the platform and began a pilot in, in June. So, you know, we quickly ran, ramped up, uh, we, we morphed a few of our activities, um, and we piloted uh, the fitness of this uh, platform um, this past June. Um, and then, you know, we chose to dress test drive um, different types of our curriculum, some that were more fun in nature or lighter in nature, and then others that were maybe a little, um, you know, deeper in subject matter, just to really find and understand how was our curriculum going to play in the virtual world. Um, and with that, we really quickly learned um, that it's not the same as in person and that you really had to significantly adjust and change your curriculum to make it more engaging. So, you know, we immediately saw, OK, we got to go into something that's more colorful and more creative to really, um, you know, keep the kids attention. So the first adjustment we made was to go from, you know, um, handouts and lesson plan type of curriculum to PowerPoint curriculum, right? And transforming all that into PowerPoint. Um, and again, something that was very colorful, that allows us to use photos and GIFs and other multimedia um, to really make it, you know, again, uh, entertaining if I may, um, but really, again, just to really to keep the kids engaged. So this slide is just an example of our question of the day, also known, now known as in our new virtual program, eTalk. Um, and we use these questions to focus on pertinent topics and to simulate conversations, as well as to continue to fortify the bonds between participants as they continue to learn about each other. So again, as you're developing your curriculum, look for those opportunities to continue, um, not just to have your curriculum goals, uh, but to continue to, to allow your mentors and mentees to bond with one another. So I'll show you a little bit more on our next slide. So next slide, please. So this slide is an example of how we then bridge into one of our main lessons. And that is, this one is covering online ethics and digital responsibility. So as you can see, we were able to ask our students four questions to really help gauge the knowledge base. So what were we working with? Um, which is very similar to what we did at the beginning of this workshop. And this really helps determine how our mentors will actually facilitate the remainder of the activity. For this activity, students were sent many supply kits that included true and false signs. Having the signs allow for more interactive engagement. So if you guys are gonna go into the virtual world, I, I do recommend sending a little supplies kit because you'll, you'll need some tools to really make your, your, your engagement um, uh, or, to make your curriculum more interactive, I should say. So having a little mini supply kit, whether it's markers, crowns, little signs, cutouts, scissors, um, just uh, things that the kids can utilize as you're now delivering your curriculum virtually. Um, so anyway, having these signs really um, made it fun and interactive. And as the kids were holding up their, their true or false signs, their peers were able to see how everybody was responding. We also made sure to train our mentors that after each question is presented and answer to follow up. This is so important to follow up with open ended questions. We really train our mentors. Try to stay away from yes or no questions because you're just going to get the bobblehead kind of thing. Um, so it's really great to ask open ended questions to really get our kids to explain their answers. Um, for example, here's some examples of some open ended questions like what was your initial thought or reaction when you first heard the question? 
Um, and, and so just again, asking that open-ended questions. And then the results of a carefully designed curriculum with well-trained mentors really will result in robust conversations. And that is when, you know, at the end of the day, you know, look for that opportunity, you know, to allow for an exchange of thoughts and ideas, you know, allowing our kids to share emotionally what's going on. And then if, if you're able to do that, then your students and mentors really bond and they learn from one another. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to take an opportunity to point out two more things is that um, that we needed to address in our virtual mentoring world. So we first, we quickly learned that mentors must be more proactive and dynamic in their delivery. So they need to be energetic, forceful, and more than ever well prepared for their sessions because you don't want um, that dead air, or that dead time when they're facilitating virtually. And furthermore, and I say this consistently, in-person sessions allow for forgiveness that is really difficult to get away with in a virtual setting. So for example, an in-person session, it's easy for kids to shy away, hide behind their friends or backpacks or find a distraction. So if your mentors are well-trained on how to facilitate your curriculum virtually, have enthusiasm and energy, then your kids will stay engaged, they'll stay focused, and most importantly, will enjoy the experience overall. So think about this. So this generation of kids communicates, learns, and leverages their real life experience from social media and electronic communication. A virtual mentoring program will allow you to meet them right there, right where they're comfortable. And if facilitated well, the impact can be tremendous if you really think about that. So keep this in mind. You know, having a kind heart doesn't translate well virtually. You need to find the right kind of mentors who are willing to put on a bit of a show. We currently are training our virtual mentors to excitedly greet each mentee as they come in and leave session. Um, and then to add context and to be excited about each session topic. And we emphasize this heavily in training that it's not what you say, but rather how you say it that makes all the difference with student engagement. And at the end of sessions, we ask that mentors keep their energy levels up to thank everyone for coming and sharing and that they don't want to miss out on next week's session because it's a good one and that you know they've got a great story that they couldn't fit in that day and that they don't want to miss out um, next week. So again, remember the importance of the screen test that I talked about earlier um, and look for mentors who are dynamic and have engaging personalities. And another big change we had to make was to scale back on the length of our curriculum. We quickly discovered that we had to be more concise and efficient in our curriculum de delivery in order to keep the kids engaged and create a sense of accomplishment for everyone because we were noticing we had too much and the kids and the mentors weren't feeling like they ac accomplished everything. But it doesn't mean though that we don't encourage relationship-based mentors. Um, we really want our mentors to stay away from being task-based, but having that breadth of your curriculum will allow for that relationship based uh, kind of focus, you know, to flourish. Um, so think about that. So allow for the breath um, that I mentioned earlier so that your mentors or mentees are having meaningful and thoughtful dialogue. So instead of having multiple goals in one session, um, like we used to, we now have honed in into just one objective that is uh, facilitated very thoughtfully and carefully. All right, next slide. Along with the adjustments I previously mentioned, we also find and learned of, of, of new opportunities and tools that we didn't have before. Um, so our new virtual approach is allowing us to conduct polls that give us instant results, utilize the chat feature, utilize a whiteboard, breakout rooms, and so on. And I love the breakout rooms because if the group is a little restless or a little quiet, you can break out into rooms and, and, and take advantage of your one to four, one to five ratio and have smaller working group sessions. Um, so, you know, it's been pretty incredible for us to creatively tap and integrate um, each of these features into our curriculum delivery. So we really managed to incorporate these things into our actual curriculum delivery. All right, next slide. So in closing, we knew, we knew that the jury was out on whether or not virtual group mentoring would generate student engagement or have impactful results. We learned, however, through the pilot in which we conducted the pre and post, uh, pre and post assessment, assessment that the program actually worked and that the kids enjoyed the experience. You know, at the end of the program, many of the kids didn't want the program to end and, and many of them felt very grateful to have someone to talk to during the COVID crisis. So as you can see in this slide, student attendance also improved through the course of the pilot. The kids were having fun and they wanted more. 
Another added benefit to the whole virtual world is being able to show your funders and donors your programs in action. So this is a great opportunity. Sometimes that windshield time or limited time that our funders have doesn't allow them to come out and see your programs. Well, guess what? Now they can come out and see your program. And we did that. So during our pilot, we invited a few of our foundations to do a site visit. And as a result, our funding increased. Can you believe it? The funding increased. We couldn't believe it. We were so shocked. Um, but it was because our funders were really pleased with what they observed. They were able to observe the program in action and from the comfort of their guests. So again, another interesting perk from having an online mentoring you know, program. So all in all, after successfully running our pilot, tweaking our curriculum, analyzing our metrics, um, you know, you know, I'm proud to say we're excited to launch our program this fall. We're, you know, we're already in recruitment and training and screening mode, so we're launching the program in fall. So again, I just lastly just want to reiterate, as I mentioned before, we really live in a digital society where young people are shaping their values and beliefs online. So why not use these digital opportunities to help shape their values and beliefs in a positive way? So I'd like to thank and end by thanking everyone for all your hard work to inspire, strengthen, and build confident youth. All right, Jerry, I'll turn it back over to you. And actually, I think you have one more slide. Oh, sorry, Jerry. So, you know, this slide again just really covers um, much of what I said before, um, you know, the expansion uh, you know, of capacity, the cost savings, you know, there is a cost savings uh, being virtual, um, uh, you know, parent participation, parent participation uh, was not one of our, our, our for wasn't really our strongest forte. Uh, but lo and behold, we learned in the pilot that, again, just like our funders, parents were able to participate. And so, you know, we used to have about 10 to 20 percent parent um, engagement when we would do our student info session orientations. In the pilot, we had 95 percent uh, participation. Our parents were jumping in. They wanted to learn. They wanted to hear. They wanted to be able to really fortify what their kids were learning in our program at home. So it's been a beautiful thing to be able to tap into this new Zoom world. Um, our mentors, our mentors are really appreciating it. We had veteran mentors also participate in the pilot and they were like, wow, this is awesome. You guys have made it so easy, so user friendly for those my age. Um, the term we use, color by numbers, are able to facilitate easily. They really love the breath um, that I mentioned before and having that opportunity to really have great dialogue with the kids um, and so on. So. You know, at the end of the day, I, I just can't, you know, uh, say it enough. Uh, the virtual mentoring is a new experience for us, but it seems to be a very exciting experience. Um, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say it looks like it has great opportunity to have many, many pa uh, tangible uh, positive results. All right, Jerry. Great, thanks. So I think we're at question time, and I'm going to turn my camera back on. And William, if you will turn yours on too. And um, Minnie, you're going to uh, relate some of the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry and William. It's been great. We got a lot of questions. And before I go into the question section, I do want to point out that I know some of the links to the handouts, um, you were all were having some trouble accessing them. So we will be sending everything out to the audience after the webinar including the slides and all the links to the handouts and different resources um, so don't worry about that you will get access to that okay so to go into the questions um william there are a bunch of questions asking what platform did you end up using for online meetings was it zoom uh, well, Zoom is one of the platforms that we use or one of the tools that we use, uh, but the actual platform that's really uh, housing all our information um, and allowing for the mentee profiles to be built, for the mentor profiles to be built, um, which then um, has built in algorithms that allow for a matching process. And then from there, you know, uh, it creates the groups, um, also ha houses our curriculum content, our videos. Um, and so on. Um, so the platform, long-winded answer, the platform is called Mentor Resources Inc. Again, Mentor Resources Inc. I highly recommend them if you have a group mentoring program because they're really set up for group mentoring. As a result of us being a new client of theirs, 
they've also made a lot of changes even to their group platform. They've really enhanced it, um, you know, from all the requests that, that we made and all the little bells and whistles that we wanted to add. So, um, you know, we, we've, we set a, a lot of you up for success. So take advantage of it, call Mentor Resources. Great, thank you. We have so many questions coming in. Another question I've been seeing is, if you all could talk about any challenges you've run into in terms of technology access, access to internet, um, with your group mentoring and how you've addressed those challenges? Yeah, you know, those are real challenges. Um, and I don't think uh, there's a, a perfect solution. Um, but with distance learning going on these days, we have learned that a lot of our schools, particularly our Title I funded schools where kids are living below the poverty line, um, our schools have given our kids the tools that they actually need to be able to do distance learning. So we're able to, to piggyback on that. Um, so many of the kids already have been given Chromebooks um, or tablets or, and have hotspots. Um, so they're already in the routine, they have what they need, um, but does it happen from time to time? Absolutely. Um, but you know, you just work around, you ask the kids to log back in if their internet goes down. Um, and then for your mentors, um, you know, utilizing Zoom, you wanna make sure that they all have access to hosts in the event, you, your, your main host, the person who's clicking through the slides, their internet goes down, at least they can transfer the responsibility over to one of the other mentors and they continue your session. Thank you. I know, Jerry, you spoke about this earlier, about kind of the topic of shy mentees and making sure that you never force anybody to speak. Um, what are some ways you would recommend to encourage um, mentees, young people to kind of speak up via virtual participation? And also, how do you encourage students um, to kind of turn their camera on and be present instead of speaking? Um, it just in the chat box. Uh, well, William's had more experience virtually. I can, I can tell you what I used to do um, face, face to face, although I, I did have a practice run at a virtual program that was successful recently. Uh, so for, for face to face, uh, you just have to be aware when young people are shy. And uh, growing up, I was a really shy kid. So I had that antenna. I have a pretty darn good antenna for shy kids. And I uh, I can even kind of watch their breath and if, if they stop breathing or if they start breathing really fast and if they're fidgeting, uh, then I, as we go around the room and share, I, I, um, I, I pass them up pretty quickly. And I, uh, so I'll say something like, uh, well, first of all, you never force anybody to share. So, so uh, it, you don't have to share, but, and then as we go around, I'll say, but if you want to jump in there, jump in there at any time, because I know that sometimes young people will uh, feel okay jumping in. They just don't want that thing to rotate, you know, just uh, right around to their spot. And, and each time it gets closer, they get more anxious. The other thing that I used to do in person was to have like a little foam football or a little toy. And I'd have one person share. And I said, when you're done sharing, ask who else wants to share. And so they'll either raise their hand um, uh, or if nobody raises their hand, then the person can just fire it to the next person. And they're usually not as shy to share when they don't know that it's building up for them sharing. So I'll let William answer that for the online version. Yeah, and Jerry, you're absolutely right. We, we utilize a lot of those very same techniques in in-person. Um, but virtually, and that's a great question, and, and I laugh when you ask that question because we've experienced it all in our pilot program. Um, so we created a set of uh, guidelines, uh, student guidelines and mentor guidelines um, for facilitating or being online virtually. Um, and so I think everything is really in your setup as well as so if you're going to go into virtual, really just think about how you set it up and you set the expectations. And that is, as I mentioned before, the purpose of, of our, our orientation or our info session is to really make sure that the kids understand the expectations, the rules um, and the, you know, again, the expectations of how we're going to interact um, respectfully virtually. And so in these guidelines, we talk about, you know, being active participants. We talk about making sure that your camera is on at all times, um, that you're speaking up and clearly, 
um, and so on. And then, you know, when we do have the shyer kids, you know, just like Jerry said, we don't force, I was a shy kid and now you can't shut me up. Um, uh, but I was a shy kid and you know that you just make it worse when you're like, oh, you're shy, oh, you're shy, oh, you're so shy. Uh, that just makes you feel even more shy. Um, so we just train our mentors, don't probe, but be creative. Maybe you can ask something a little bit different to get the kids to open up. And so if you really train your mentors well, um, and they can get creative in their approach. They're like, oh, okay, hey, well, you know, it's no problem, Jerry, I understand. Hey, but what'd you have for lunch today? Um, or, hey, that's a cool shirt you have on. Is that a new shirt? So anything you can, or, and then, or start to learn more about your kids, and that builds over time. And then once you know what's that thing that really um, gets like, excited or they want to talk about, let's say it's soccer, for example, then you ask them, hey, did you watch the soccer game? Hey, did you play soccer last weekend? So whatever it may be. Um, but again, I, I will reiterate, um, setup is so important, setting up the expectations, uh, getting the ground rules in place before you actually start facilitating virtually, I think will really help with those shy kids or kids who want to hide um, themselves when they're on camera. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> and I just want to jump in there. and That, that was a really good uh, uh, explanation. In person, um, some, sometimes the, the young people that are the most shy are also the most artistic. So if you have creative artistic endeavors, uh, when those young people are working, just really acknowledge them in front of the group and that helps build their confidence. And really, you know, still waters do run deep and a lot of times it is the shy kids that are the most artistic and the deepest thinkers. And it's funny, Jerry, you're absolutely right. We incorporated some art projects throughout our curriculum for the shy kids. And once they, they've done their project and then we ask them to share, it's so incredible. Um, uh, you know what the how they think and what they share so you're absolutely right that, that's a great recommendation integrate to integrate art for your Shire kids great thank you William would you be able to share um, your guidelines for participation or your attendance goal for participations with your students in participating online um, well, it's a lengthy list um, many I'm happy to send it to you uh, but you could see the guidelines are pretty extensive and I know uh, Jerry you and I talked about this months and months ago uh, before the pandemic even happened um, that we were talking a lot about guidelines uh, group mentoring guidelines um, as well as virtual guidelines and I do have all of those in place so I'm happy to share those with you many if you want to send it out to the attendees um, but they're pretty extensive and we have parent uh, guidelines, we have mentee guidelines, and we have mentor guidelines. Great. Yes, I think the audience would love um, that list being shared, so I definitely will make sure to get that from you. Um, we have one question here about someone who's interested in expanding their group mentoring um, program, and they're wondering if you all had just some jet, like first recommendations for how to start expansion. Would you, would you like me to take that? Uh, sure, and I'll jump yeah. in if need be. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years. I said, I've been with the organization for 13 years. And, and you know, you just gotta really build on your success. I mean, I mean, that, that's my really own recommendation. Just really take baby steps. You don't wanna go too big. You wanna make sure you have a good handle on things. You wanna make sure also that you have enough mentors. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's really important because if you don't have the mentors, as of course you can't, you know, deliver your program or your services. Uh, so really keep that in mind. Like, do you have access to enough mentors to really scale your program? Do you have enough staff? Um, are your staff properly trained or have the ability to also handle, um, you know, multiple, multiple either school sites or multiple teams or groups? Um, and you want to make sure that they are also they also have the skill set. So staffing is just as important as having a, a sufficient volunteers for your program. Um, because really, if you think about it, if your volunteers aren't able to make it, um, you know your program is going to really fall to your staff to continue, you know, facilitating your activities or your curriculum. Right? They're going to be your backup. Um, but again, just taking baby steps, making sure you have the right resources making sure you're financially set up to really to be able to support those resources and that staffing, um, that your mentors are properly trained, um, that you're really looking at your metrics, that you're really doing evaluation and you're really looking you know, at your success metrics. Um, and, if, and if it's all aligning and you're seeing your success, 
um, and then, then scaling, um, you know, very carefully and thoughtfully. It, and that's great. And I would just jump in and say one, one way to expand is to also use the effective practices as a framework. And expansion is, a, of course, a lot about resources, and it's a lot about the resource of time for, for staff. So you can actually use the effective practices as a uh, time management tool or an expansion tool. So look at, uh, you know, the numbers that you want to get and then go into, okay, recruiting. What would that look like? Screening, training, matching, providing monitoring and support in providing a pos positive closure so if you use that effective practices framework i think that that's a real good way to go too thank you both i think we have time for one more question before we go into kind of the final resources and making sure um the audience you will all get the a copy of the slides as well in about less than a week um, lots of questions on virtual mentoring, I think, just because it's on top of everybody's mind right now. Um, so we have a few questions just wondering about online safety measures for virtual programming. Um, do you have requirements about how many mentors or mentees need to be present? Do you record? And also, like, how do you kind of track your information? Right. In those guidelines, you're going to see that we have very specific rules. We don't uh, allow, we won't allow. And again, it's really you either enabling or disabling uh, the features in Zoom. Um, so you want to make sure that no one's able to record. Um, you know, you, of course, you're going to set your ground rules and say no screenshots. Um, and then as far as safety, you really are going to look at your platform. Again, I, I recommend mentor resources. They've really thought about the safety of it. You know, one of the features we're also taking advantage of in mentor resources is their email, um, you know, feature. And that is to allow outside of our program. But again, it's very guided, very structured. Um, I try to make everything, uh, uh, again, colored by numbers. I even have email templates just so that I'm controlling the communication as much as possible. So I have these email templates, which I've written 36, so that the mentors are just following this email template. They'll fill in where I need them to fill in. Oftentimes, you know, I'm presenting some goofy questions, right? Because I, I still want it to be fun for the kids. I don't want it to always be serious. So I ask the mentors to answer the goofy question. Um, would you rather be bald or have hair all over your body? and they answer it and then we shoot it back to the kids and then they answer and that way when we get back on our next call we can be silly a little bit and talk about our answers or we have something a little more deeper you know who is someone you look up to in your life and why and then you know the they the mentors answer that um, but going back to safety you want to make sure that that platform has that those built that built-in safety uh, mechanism and so with mentor resources as an example i asked them i said okay with the email portion, how do I ensure that the communication is always safe? Uh, so one of the features is that you're allowed to go in as administrators and look at all the email communication. You should only allow email communication to happen through your platform. So, I mean, I can go on and on and on. So I'm gonna try to, 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 to uh, collect my thoughts here. So we only utilize parent emails. We don't utilize kids' emails. Um, the communication with emails happens through the platform, so no personal emails are exchanged. The other thing is, as I was saying, the platform, we asked them, so what if something goes in a word, a phrase, a symbol? You guys all know, you know, emojis uh, can have several meanings. Um, and so I asked, how do we ensure that none of that funny business is going on? And so they gave me this list. And I have to laugh, guys. If, if you guys use mentor resources when you see the list, it was eye opening. I, I didn't even know half of these terms existed. I had to Google um, and learn myself. But anyway, all those things really made sure that it was safe. Parent emails, no personal emails, exchange only happening through the platform, the platform having all these words and symbols that if any of those things pop up, that it alerts the administrator immediately to look at that email and make sure that it's safe. Additionally, we've also put a staff member. Uh, to participate in every call to ensure that everything is, is safe. Thank you so much, William and Jerry. I think we have just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to turn it back to Jerry to kind of close us out. But really appreciate you both um, taking the time to answer some of the questions. I know we weren't able to get to everything, but thank you. Great, and that was especially uh, interesting and exciting for me to to 
hear William's pivot. And I know that a lot of you folks out there are pivoting. So I know that that was really helpful to you, but uh, it's really good to, to see that a program is able to do it and do it successfully. Some of the uh, early research is that, that our pro programs are had, <coughs> pardon me, having trouble with virtual mentoring. But William is our role model that uh, that that it can be successful. So uh, we're just going to go through these very quickly. There's a bunch of resources that we put together. So um, yeah, I won't even read the slides because I know we're up against the end of it. But but there's some of these um, some of these documents are for one-to-one -one programs. But as I looked at them, they can be extrapolated and reworked to to use for group lessons. And we, of course, want uh, to be aware of diversity. So we have several several documents that focus on um, like uh, Native American mentoring and African American mentoring. So uh, Benny, just go ahead and run through these. I know we're up against it. So just go to these resources. You can click on them. And some of them are just a, as they say, a cornucopia of exercises. And there's Project Arrive. You can look at their their setup for the way you know they put their curriculum together. And Dr. Cooper Mink's insights for mentoring practitioners regarding Project Arrive, a group mentoring program. Next slide. So additional resources. This is Mentor Slide, but I volunteered to read it. So Mentor Scales Impact by developing and supporting a national network of affiliates. These affiliates provide the leadership and infrastructure necessary to support the expansion of quality mentoring relationships in local communities or statewide. Mentor affiliates also serve a unique role as a clearinghouse for training resources, public awareness, and advocacy. We encourage you to find out whether you have an affiliate in your region and connect with them to learn about local resources and training opportunities. Additionally, we encourage you to register your program with Mentor Connector, a national database of mentoring programs. This zip code searchable database allows mentors and mentees from across the country to find your program. Finally, check out OJJDP's National Mentoring Resource Center website for no-cost mentoring resources to help you apply evidence-based mentoring practices to your program. They provide evidence reviews on mentoring models and mentoring for special populations. Uh, they have training manuals and mentor guides reviewed by the NMRC Research Board, and they have the opportunity to request no-cost technical training or assistance, which is a very good price. Uh, remember, as a reminder, one week after this webinar, all attendees will receive an email with a link to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series webpage, where we will post the recording, slides, and additional resources. And please do not forget, we want your feedback on this webinar. So uh, in a minute or two after today's webinars, please answer the short survey to help this series become even better. And then stay connected and see you next month. Uh, email us at that web or that address, or there's the hashtag. Visit our webpage on the mentor website for past and upcoming webinars. And thank you so much for attending. And thank you so much to William Figueroa for your work at Los Angeles Team Mentoring and for 